Hey everybody, recently I've been thinking about open world level design. We have a lot of best practices when it comes to level design uh, for exterior locations like wildernesses or ruins, but we don't really have any best practices for how to design cities. I would argue that we haven't advanced at all in the past two decades. GTA 5 cities are beautiful but they're not really places you live. They don't feel like you exist in the city. They feel like there are a couple of buildings in the city and then the rest is just a beautiful backdrop for you to use as you move between glowing icons on your minimap. I made a lot of tweets about that, made some videos about that, tried to figure out what I wanted and why, it wasn't, why I wasn't getting it. And then I thought to myself, well, why do I think it's possible to do better? And this is why, because Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines exists. This is an old game. I'd be shocked if you hadn't heard of it. If you haven't heard of it, you can go look it up. You play a vampire, it's at night. Most people consider this to be a flawed masterpiece because of the writing. I consider it to be a flawed masterpiece because of the level design. The writing is great, but the level design is what structures it. We're going to talk about two things that this game does that no other game has really done in quite the same way. And that would be wayfinding and clustering. First, why is this game unique? How does this game feel if you've never played it? That's the hard part. It's hard to tell you how this game feels because there aren't really any other games that have ever felt like this. I'm sure that you can come up with some that are kind of close, but I don't think so. This is something unique about this game. It feels alive and dead. It feels open and closed, big and small. Uh, crowded and lonely. It's very, very strange and iconic. And the reason it can feel like that is because of the level design, which is very unique and hits in a very unusual way. So let's talk about it. First, the wayfinding. Wayfinding is just how the player finds their way around and how they know when there's something interesting. Because this is at night, all of the wayfinding in this game is done through lights. We've got the street lights to show us that the street this is, the, this is the main street. If a street isn't lit, it's a side street. It's a dangerous, sketchy place, which means it's perfect for you, a vampire. Everything that's not a street light is a wayfinding light that is a point of interest. Oh, look. Trip's Pawn Shop. This is a very bright light. It's big. It's bold. It's on a giant sign. And the reason for that is because they want you to know that this is an important area. This is actually the main shop in the region where you buy and sell stuff. So for most builds you're going to want to use Trip's Pawn Shop rather extensively. Over on the other side, we've got a tattoo parlor. This tattoo parlor is lit, but not very brightly. And that's because you're not really supposed to notice it. It's actually a side quest. But you're not really able to even get in until you get the side quest. And so it's really there to help you find it once you know it exists. But you can find it without that. You just can't do anything with it. Oh, look, medical clinic. That's a pretty bright light. And look, this entire front area is bright. Well, that's because this is a core location. It's a building that you go in hundreds of times. Everything is like that. The flashing red, that's because that's the direction to go if you want to go to the asylum. This, it's an apartment building that you go into, and there's lots of stuff going on in there. This, of course, it's a gallery you go into and slash paintings. The door is dark. Why is the door dark? Because the actual entrance is that door. So here, there's some bright lights surrounding it and a bright light on it. That is the way to get to the beach. If we turn around, that blue light on Gimbal's prosthetics, there is a side quest back there. This setup is very, very reliable. Basically, anything that gets lit is something that's going to draw the player's attention. If you want them to notice it immediately, you light it brightly. If you want, to, want them to notice it uh, later, when they've been told about it, you light it softly. Very, very basic, and it works wonderfully. It's lit, so you can go in. It's lit, so you can go in. Another time where it's lit, so you can go in. It's lit, so you can go in. Brightly lit, because it's a major plot area. Brightly lit, because it's a major plot area. Even this is brightly lit. What is it? What are you trying to tell me? Oh, you're trying to tell me there's a map here. What about that? That little smudge in the background. Is this, little, this little smudge of light? Surely that can't be a wayfinding light. Oh wait, it is. Hello, how are you doing? This is how the game works. All of these lights 
always lead to a place that you want to go. It's wonderful. It's just a, a brilliantly minimalist way to set things up. Obviously, using lighting to tell the player where to go is nothing new. Virtually every get level design thing you ever talk about or read about will tell you how to do that, but using it in an open world game is fairly rare, and largely that's because the sun usually cycles in those games, and the sun really washes out any attempt to light things, so in order to light things, you have to kind of shelter it from the sun or create light traps. It's really quite challenging if there is going to be a sun. But in this game, there's no sun. It's always dark. Let's talk about... Well, I guess I should tell you, that means that you can just create whatever sort of layouts you want. You don't have to be clever about making sure that there's a hill in the way or that they can see one thing and not another thing because you just shine lights on the things you want them to notice and they'll notice them. And the layout is secondary. It almost doesn't matter. All of these streets are square and flat, which is something I'd normally say is terrible, but the focus is on guiding the player's eye with light. That said, the other half of this is the content clustering. In a city, 90% of your content is people. People can stand next to people. People can get along with people. That means that your content can be very, very tightly clustered. For example, you could have 15 random people hanging out in one location. It doesn't matter whether these are scripted people or generative people. Look, there's a cop just walked past a hooker and there's a lady in the background and then there's four people here and the cops walking by them. None of that is scripted. It's all just random. But each of these people has their own algorithmic personality and responses to different kinds of play that you can try to, to do. You can try and seduce them or cast spells on them or sneak up on them or waylay them or whatever it is you want to try and do. And, you know, they all have their own characteristics and because they're people, they can walk past each other. This guy here, I could grab him right now as long as there's no cop behind me, but he's not programmed to hang out there. And if he walks by the other characters, they're not going to suddenly get in a fight with him. In a fantasy game, you drop a dragon and you drop a farmer, you have to separate them so that the player doesn't think, why doesn't the dragon eat the farmer? But in a city game, you can put an elder vampire next to a chef and it's going to be fine because they're both people. They can rub shoulders. This allows you to not only cycle content throughout your levels without worrying about creating random chaos, it also allows you to create hyper-dense clusters of content. Instead of having to separate your content by vast distances so that it feels natural, you actually do the opposite. You cluster it together as tightly as possible. Here, for example, is a bar. You can see the lighting. Lighting means this guy's important. Lighting means I can dance here. Chupa -chupa -boom, chupa -boom. Boom, boom. Lighting means I can go up there, but it's not very important because it's not very well lit. Uh, we got some psychedelic errors happening here. I'm not 100% sure um, what went wrong with the game, but there's definitely something going on there. And lastly, over here, this is a place you're not supposed to notice immediately. This is the way up to talk to the, the local regent, um, but you're not supposed to notice it until you know it exists. So it's lit softly, just like all of those side quest areas. But putting the lighting aside, you can see that there's a lot of people here. This is actually kind of a, a, a small crowd. Some of these people are scripted. This person is scripted. This lady is scripted. I think there's one other scripted person. But for the most part, it doesn't really matter whether they're scripted or not because they're, they're able to get along. If you were in a fantasy game and you dump 30 people into one location, the question would be, what are they doing? Like, they must all be adventurers, and they must all be bandits, or they must all be one thing or another, and everything in that region is going to be entirely about, you know, that particular bandit or whatever, the fact that it's all bandits. Uh, but in this area, each of these people could have their own side quests, they could have their own plot points and personalities, and you'd buy it. Sure, they all happen to be here, they all happen to be into clubbing, but you wouldn't bat an eye if it turned out that one of these people was a computer programmer, and one of these people needed help robbing a bank, it would be completely within your expectations. You'd accept it because they just happen to be here rubbing shoulders. It's not like they're arranged specifically as representatives of one group. I hope that's clear. 
I apparently have turned on debug mode. I'm not sure how I did that. Anyway, um, the point I'm trying to make is that these these two secrets are the reason that this game feels the way it feels. You go from these large open spaces that are carefully lit to guide you around, but are still large enough that you have to walk. And then you emerge into these densely populated, highly contextualized areas full of people. And it's really something that gives you this, this wonderful splash that you really can't get in any other game that I've ever played. Um, or maybe if I have, I've forgotten it, but I don't think so. Feel free to let me know if you disagree. But let's go ahead and go to another location just to give you the same basic ideas, right? So here's Red Spot. You can tell it's important because it's really brightly lit. I wonder if friggin' chicken's gonna be important. I think that's just for fun. This is brightly lit. You can go in. This is brightly lit. You can go in. And so on and so on and so on and so on and so on. It's all about lighting it specifically so that you understand where you can go. And similarly, the content here is clustered. Like in the Lucky Star Hotel, there's like five or six side quests. And uh, you can go in and do them. And you keep coming back to the Lucky Hotel. And the Ass Pole and the Adult Place, I think there's another five or six um, named characters that do things. I can't take you into Vesuvius, but there's definitely five or six named characters in there and a whole bunch of non-named characters. It's these dense clusters where you go from being outside to being inside. And it's like inside is full of people and there's stuff. And outside is is a place for you to be uh, hidden and, and unnoticed. If you're outside, then you're in secret. You're hiding. Even if you're in the open, nobody knows who you are. This is something that works really, really well. And there's a couple more things about clustering that make it really valuable. One of the things is that the humans don't all have to be active. So if you've got, say, in Red Spot, for example, if you've got people in Red Spot and you've got one person that does a Chapter 1 mission and two people that have a Chapter 2 mission and one person has a Chapter 3 mission, they can all be in Red Spot the whole game. All you do is make them wake up. They stop saying generic phrases when you talk to them and they start saying plot-related phrases. And if you decide, you can always have more people enter Red Spot or leave Red Spot because they can rub shoulders with whoever else is in there. There's not going to be any difficulty in mixing and matching your content as you see fit as the game evolves, whether that's piecemeal or in chapters. Uh, similarly, if there's people in there, you know, you got one person who's related to a stealth challenge and one person who's related to a combat challenge and one person who's related to a social challenge and there's a magic challenge person and a cash challenge person, they can all be there and the player can activate them in whatever sort of timing they want to activate them in. And that is a really powerful way to add density without adding or to add more content without adding any more size. Like, if you're at a fantasy game, you, you have a dragon challenge. Well, the dragon challenge has to take up, like, a square acre of space. Because otherwise, what are you going to do? The dragon is, is going to eat anything else in the area, and the player doesn't want to accidentally walk into the dragon challenge. It's a huge pain. But in this case, you just put the quote-unquote dragon right next to someone else. And it's fine, because they're people, and people can be in the same place. Or at least they used to be able to be that way until very recently. We won't go into that. This is Chinatown. It's also done in the, basically the same way. The lighting is a little bit more aggressive here. But, I mean, there's a plot points over there. I think there's like three side missions in Sangs. Over here we've got, I think, four named characters and two side quests. Um, and each of these places has its own setup. And the lighting, the wayfinding lighting helps you find your way around so that eventually you discover, oh, look, here's a place we can go in because the wayfinding lighting helped us find it. This is a really well thought out way to create levels and it creates these wonderful little pockets of density. Whether these pockets of density are, you know, inside in their own sub area or whether it's like this and they just happen to be clusters of people standing around. Hey, look, there's a place we can go in. It's a backdoor entrance. Anyway, this is the basic thing that I think we've stopped doing in these games. I think we've stopped creating cities that are like this. And that's a shame, because this kind of city feels really alive. 
It's easy to move through. It's easy to see what sort of interesting things you might want to look at. It's easy to find interesting people. And you get these marvelous density clusters. Instead of everything being kind of the same density, kind of like pudding, you get these areas that are really heavy and meaty and these areas that are really light and fluffy. It just works out really well for me. Let me know what you think. Bye.